So, hello and welcome to this lecture or uh, part of the 20th century American drama course. Today we are looking at Edward Albee's 1962 play, Who is Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Now, this is one of the early plays of Albee. Um, he had some minor success before this with his um, play, Zoo Story, which was um, performed in 1959 and this was first performed in the year 1962. So, we can see that there it is set against like the World War II has ended a few years before. There are references to that war and there are there is the Cold War in the air with Russia. So, there is this lot of tension of war, a grand tensions that kind of cloud the play, which of course appear in the play, but not always very directly. So, this play, which was uh, performed first in 1962, um, it has three acts and today, um, in the, today and in the next lecture, we are going to discuss act one, which is called fun and games. So, as you can see, it was first performed October 13, 1962 in New York City at the Billy Rose Theatre. And it has uh, four characters, um, Martha and George, who are a couple, and who as host are receiving another couple, Nick and Honey. So, Martha, um, George is a professor at a college where he is a professor of history who has been teaching there for some time and his wife Martha is the daughter of the president of the college. And Nick has joined the college recently as a biology professor and he is accompanied by his, with a, by his wife Honey when they come to the residence of the George and of George and Martha. So, and you can see here that we have the description of uh, the characters, it is only a four, four people play. Um, so, Martha is a large boisterous woman, 52, looking somewhat younger and we must keep in mind the different references to age in the play because age plays a critical role in the play. The, the one huge important aspect is the difference of age in Martha, George and Nick and Honey. Nick and Honey are much younger than their hosts. Mm. Then we have George, her husband, 46, thin, hair going grey. So, we see that George is younger than Martha and that is a reference in the play that comes up pretty often. And we have Honey, 26, a petite blonde girl, rather plain and Nick, 30, her husband, blonde, well put together, good looking. Um, something uh, interesting that we would like to um, point out as we begin the play is that the men are referred to as the husbands of the women and not the women are not referred to as wives of the husband. And if we see that general stage direction or, or I would not call general stage direction, but general methods of introducing people, you would see that this is Mr. This and this is his wife misses something. But we see that the women here are introduced first and the husband's identity are introduced against the women. So, the identity of the women are more independent than somehow the husbands and we see there are different reasons of that. We will see that the marriages are often a marriages of convenience which cause further trouble. So, it is somehow though the men have some less power or they are a bit emasculated in the play which is hinted by this introduction. And as we will move on, you will see that when you read the play and I will strongly suggest that you read the play that the stage direction is pretty copious. If you compare it with some other play, let us say the Piano Lesson by August Wilson, which is another play will, that will be done in this course, that the stage direction is pretty sparse in that play. Whereas, if you see this, so Albie kind of had in his head just the way this play should be performed and he has for long held a little bit of authorial control over how the play will be performed and how it should be taken, how it should be presented. He has kind of held that control all his life. So, it starts and the scene is the living room of a house on the campus of a small New England college. And we start with act one, fun and games. So, what I will do is I will read out certain important uh, dialogues from the play and we will discuss them then. So, we have um, as the play starts a boisterous entry. So, and you would have to remember that this is a play that is being enacted on a stage and this stage also plays a very important role here. So, if you look at the title, Who is Afraid of Virginia Woolf? So, it is taken from a 1933 Disney song called Who is Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? And if you look up the video of it on YouTube, I suggest you do, you would see that a big wolf is haunting or is trying to kill and eat three piggies three small piggies who are like meat for 
the wolf and what we get there is a sense that death is always haunting us that we are always being the wolf is the figure of death and the pigs are living but they are always being haunted by this figure of death but I'll again like to again point out another thing is that the the title is borrowed from a cartoon it's a cartoonish title in a sense it's and the title then the title is again if a cartoon does a parody like if you see that the pigs are not actually afraid of the wolves in the sense they should be and it's pretty funny so it's a wolf trying to come and eat the pigs we will die if they if the wolf succeeds in doing so but there is a, an air of being funny about it so and if, if you see that the play takes it forward the play takes it far ahead that in its use of comedy so it, it takes um, a place in very serious manner so there is a fight between couples and it's it's very serious what's happening but it's presented in a comedic manner it's a deep tragedy of personal lives a deep tragedy of being unable to connect with a person the way you would want to but it has been posted to us has been given to us through different flashes of comedy but what that reference to that cartoon the title this cartoonish title does is to tell us that hey we should not discard we should not discard the meaning of seriousness when it's presented in the garb of um, comedy so we have this there's something that and if you think that the big bad wolf is turned into virginia wolf so what can, parallels can we draw from there that there is a slight a similar not slight similarity in name between the big bad wolf and virginia wolf and this um, the wolf the big bad wolf in the disney movie is a male character while as virginia wolf is a female character so what we have here is the is a reference to the archetypal she wolf character that we often see appearing in different guises in different media representations so the and we can see the character of martha in the light of a she wolf if we choose to do so it can give us an important lens and can be one of the entries that we can make sense of the title that helps us make sense of the title so it starts with george saying that for god's sake martha it's two o'clock in the and we don't know like it's what is it two o'clock in the afternoon or in the evening um in the afternoon or at midnight sorry um but we see that it's ref continuous references of something being late you know and this idea of lateness of not arriving is very important in the play we'll see that George and Martha are a couple who probably wanted children but at this age it's probably too late for them to have a child of their own so this ideas of lateness that it's getting late the time is running out as i mentioned before that the big bad wolf carries with it the sense from where the title is borrowed a sense of death and we feel like death is always chasing us that our time is running out and the play starts with that sense it starts with a sense of something time is running out time is often like vanishing we and there's a need to hold on to something but against what so you know we'd have to look at it and then martha makes a reference to a betty davis movie and but they cannot remember the name of the movie and they say that some goddamn warner brothers epic so you see that the films are playing a very critical role for uh, this drama so the title is borrowed from a disney movie and we have now a warner brothers epic and the play will very soon be turned into a very successful commercially su as well as critically successful film which i suggest is again a movie that can be referred to for better understanding of the play and so we see and one of the things that i would like to highlight as we read some themes that will come to visit us is a theme that i would like to introduce first is the theme of dehumanization so if you read through the play you will find there are lots of references to objects humans as objects humans as animals which adds to this idea of dehumanization in the play if you read through it closely you will see many of these images are there people are calling people animals and objects something like that and if you see it starts and she is married to joseph cotton or something that's martha saying and george correct sir says somebody so you see there is this kind of individual dignity there is a sense of loss of individual dignity that the play play tries to restore but is often not too successful because of its awareness of the failure of the project and 
again we come to this line where Martha says that in the in the movie Betty Davis plays the role of a housewife. She walks into the modest living room of the modest cottage, modest Joseph Cotton has set up set her up in. So you can see there is this continuous reference to modesty and as we will read through the play you will see that there have been lot of charges of immodesty, immorality, vulgar language that has been leveled against the play over the years. But you can see Albi at the outset kind of discuss this idea of modesty through Martha that this is a play where modesty is does not hold much importance. This is a world where modesty, propriety, a sense of self, a sense of place do not because we will soon see the kind of ugly fight that the couples get in and the games they play and we will come to the idea of fun and games, what do games mean as we continue to read up the play. But I would like you to take note of these disparaging comments about modesty, that modesty, propriety, these take a toss in the play, they do not make it much long. And you see here like there is, it is starting at midnight and they say that I am tired dear, uh, it is late and besides. And this is when they know that a, a guest, guests are appearing to visit them. And Martha says, I don't know what you are tired about, you haven't done anything all day, you didn't have any classes or anything. And George says, well I am tired, if your father didn't set up this goddamn Saturday night orgies all the time. So we can see here what George is feeling from is a sense of exhaustion. You can see as you read through it and exhaustion is different from tiredness. While we are tired from of something like okay I have had too many classes in the day and I am tired because of that, exhaustion is a, is a more overbearing condition. You can be exhausted out of nothing, you can just feel exhausted because of nothing. That is what is happening to George, he has been exhausted and as we will read through, we will see that there have been experiences in his life, experience of his relationship with Martha and with Martha's father whom Martha calls daddy whose name does not appear in the play but he appears as daddy and this uh, reference to daddy will come to it, we will uh, we'll read his character when his reference but wanted to take note of this, uh, this idea of tiredness versus exhaustion, that exhaustion is different from tiredness. Even though George says he is tired, what he means to say or what his condition is later extrapolated as is a form of exhaustion. And he says that this goddamn Saturday night orgies. Now I will have to ask you to take note that in ancient Greece and there is a certain amount of references to Greece that come up that in ancient Greece there would be banquets that would be held. So these banquets would start around at midday and they would go on till night where lot of stimulating discussions would take place, it would be a form of discussion and drinking and people would get drunk but not so, so they would mix water with wine so they did not get too drunk too fast so that they could have um, knowledgeable discussions while they were enjoying the company of others. So that is something the idea of a Greek banquet that I would like to uh, for you to keep in mind that they are coming back from what can be a not quite a Greek banquet then again like whatever form of western, classic western civilization that comes here is a form of decadence, is a form of corruption. So if you have read T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, you will see that after the first world war, T.S. Eliot does something like that to his wasteland. He says that there has been a legacy of the West, a culture of the West and the current climate to a certain extent signifies a kind of decadence. The decadence of the culture, the decadence of the promise, if you read um, the tal individual talent, um, tradition and individual talent by T.S. Eliot, he draws this connection between Greek, the, he draws this connection like he kind of attaches the English poet to his Greek predecessors, he creates this line of descent, he creates this line of um, inheritance and inheritance is again another important thing in the play that we will take note. So a line of descent from the Greek poets. So and here you also see that there will constantly be references of Greek culture and Greek arts that there is a sort of here also like Eliot Albi traces a descent from a Greek origin but what he does is again like Eliot show that there has been a corruption, that this is almost like a parody and like I would again like you to see that the title, the title itself is a parody, it is a mockery and the play and the culture and the pretensions of culture, the pretensions of high culture, whatever that these people take part in are a form of corruption, are a form of parody, have been, are hollowed out of whatever great standards they were held in. 
again like if you see here that George says that Martha brays which is something that a donkey does and so this, this continues the image of dehumanization that I was just talking about. And another thing you would like to see is that George says softly, all right, you don't bray. And Martha says in a hurt manner, I do not bray. So again, like you would like to think that Albi in this play, it would, if you look up some of the critical commentary on the play, you would see that there is a constant discussion of how Albi takes up the theme of real, reality and illusion in the play. What is real and what is, uh, what is realism and what is illusion. And as you have already seen through the figures of Miller and Eugene O'Neill that realism and expressionism, they made a huge impact on the American stage. So the stage was supposed to be, the plays were realist, realism had its whole punch. But again, at the same time, what Alby does here is kind of mix this uh, sort of illusion and realism. Because, and kind of in a sense, you can see that if uh, the influences of the epic theater, the Brechtian epic theater and the absurd theater here, epic theater because one of the key um, ways that the epic theater would work would be what Brecht called alienation. It would constantly tell the audience that, hey, what you're witnessing is uh, not quite real life, it's on a stage. But through that alienation, he would achieve certain political effects. So here also, Albi through his constant juxtaposition of reality and illusion and we'll see that there are lots of um, make-believe things that are being said in the play which we do not know are true or not. Like there is a son who's mentioned, who's supposed to be arriving and coming, who never arrives, who we don't even, but it's mentioned that he's not even real because George and Martha do not have a child. So, but then again, there are other references, dubious references, where something is said like, oh, this is real, this happened to this person. And, but it's left hanging, like, is it? Did it really happen? So, if you can see that uh, we are left hanging in a sense, that this, this clear distinction that we'd like to make, okay, so this is real, this is illusion, this is real, and this is fiction, kind of breaks down in the play. And this is done with... This is what makes a piece of literature more effective because you would often hear arguments that, oh, this is from a book, this is not real. But books are also part of life experiences. What other people say about them, even if it's not real, if they pose it as real, then it has a sort of way of impacting us. So this idea of fiction and reality, reality and illusion, these this differentiations get very murky. And Alby is very aware that this is being watched on a stage by people who are aware that they are watching something on a stage. So as we'll see that he constantly takes into account the gaze of the audience. So you would see that there's a reference, we'll come to that, we'll, um, let's continue reading and we'll get there. And at a point we have Martha pouting and she says, make me a drink. And this pouting and asking things, so this is a childish behavior and we see that the adults in this play often revert to a form of childishness. It's to kind of escape from the realism of their lives, they would like to be children again. And there is a story later on told in the play of a child who kills, inadvertently kills both his mother and father, both his parents. And so we see there that the final, uh, what happens to that boy final as a punishment is kind of given an injection and he kind of goes into a stupor and lulls down. And we see that the way that injection, that medicine works for the child is the same way drinking works for these adults. They constantly lull themselves into a form of sleep, into a form of slumber with the help of this drink in a way to manner of trying to escape reality. So they say that a nightcap would kill either of, he doesn't think, a nightcap is something of like a drink taken with some hot substance so that it helps you sleep better. But then Martha says, a nightcap, are you kidding? We've got guests. Then George says, disbelieving, we've got what? Guests. Guests. So this idea that guests are coming and George doesn't know who is coming. So these are strangers coming to their house. And uh, one text that I can refer to you for this idea is like, is Derida's, Jacques Derida's of hospitality. So this is a classic scenario of hospitality that here is a couple who are going to um, welcome into their house strangers or foreigners who are coming for the first time. And Derrida would say that the question of hospitality is the question of foreigner. 
it is how you welcome a foreigner into your home into your homeland or it could be anything how you welcome a foreigner and we'll see that how this thing goes and they don't actually know that who are coming over and they're like what's their name and we'll see that there is this constantly this of not being able to remember names on places like the play started with a sort of guessing like what's the name of the movie then we have what's the name of the people so there's this connection of between remembering names that is made in the play and we see that it's after two o'clock in the morning this idea of being late it's it's and and um, it's it the play goes on in a way that it's almost so late that it's often early you know that it's so late it gets so late that it it gets early so this it takes place in a liminal time it's so late that it's often early so there's a point where um, george says that we could have welcomed them on sunday and martha says well if you think about it it's already sunday so we're taking this play is taking place at a liminal time in a time where kind of like things are some things are uh, can take place some things are more permissible than probably other times this is a time of you know like in macbeth you see there's a time that is mentioned as when the roosters come back home and the spirits come out of the grave it's, it's like that and if you think about it there are certain shakespearean overtones here especially with hamlet so if you see hamlet in hamlet we have an enactment of a play through which hamlet tries to um a play within a play with through which hamlet tries to prick the conscience of the king and here also we have something like that so we have play acting within the play so the audience are watching a play and the characters on the stage are also enacting fun and games and plays among them like they're playing so now we'll do this play and games and games have the connotation of play and plays again have connotations of drama play drama so you can see how games plays drama this become very complicated and entangled categories which can be very difficult to separate so it has a very hamlet like quality in it as the stage different games and plays on the stage which is very edifying for the audience which is very edifying for the people who are seeing it in a in a very hamletesque way here you see that where are they they're getting slowly exasperated when when will the guests come and a part of uh, waiting for the guest is a sort of kind of um, sort of haste that when when will they arrive when will they arrive you know that's uh, when we also have guests at our house when we are looking forward to having guests over at our house uh, we'd say when will they come when will they come but in a in a weird subversion here george actually doesn't want them to come but still we find them asking the same questions that when will they come so you can see that the same question often goes for like when you're too eager to have someone over or when you're totally not eager to have someone over but the questions somehow sound the same when they come out and you see already that there are certain cracks between the relationship of martha and george appearing george says that i wish you'd tell me about something sometime i wish you'd stop springing things on me all the time so you can see there's this lack of consent that works in the relationship that martha has made a decision at two o'clock that people would come over to their house which george doesn't know and again like if i refer back to the derrida takes off hospitality derrida locates that who has this right of giving hospitality who extends hospitality and we see often that he says that in traditional manner it's the patriarch of the house who extends the hospitality is the person who plays the role of the father within the household who extends this hospitality but here we see that if we see george as the patriarch in the house which is not we'll see different ways that george is emasculated in the play which kind of takes away this idea that he could be the patriarch who does the hosting so his emasculation different references to emasculation in the play are also important that he is quite not the host and again like i would like you to take you to that uh, scene in macbeth where ba macbeth is hosting a banquet where banquo's ghost comes up and it's failure of macbeth to do the hosting to become the patriarchal figure and the king he has become the king the king is the ultimate patriarchal figure so it's his failure to assume the role of that patriarchal figure that i would like you to keep in mind 
again, like if you see here, poor Georgie Porgy, put up on pie, oh, what are you doing? Are you sulking? Ha, huh? let me see, are you sulking? So these are like childish way of talking to another person, as I mentioned, that he's probably feeling deep hurt, but she would be like, uh, childish, are you not quite kind of acknowledging his hurt, quite not acknowledging his pain, because that might also mean trouble for him. And we see in the play, sometimes they, the couple do come together to acknowledge their pain, each other's pain, and that's the moment when they're the most vulnerable, but this vulnerability is not sustainable for long. And we see them that kind of getting into their shells and kind of fighting and launching against each other. And we see this song coming up for the first time. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Virginia Woolf, Virginia Woolf, ha ha ha. I thought it was a scream, a real scream. You didn't like it, huh? And George says, well, I didn't find it too funny. Now, we'll have to remember that this party, when it was happening, it was happening in the presence of who's called Daddy, as uh, the father of Martha. So, and he's the president of the college. So, maybe if he's the one who came up with the line, everyone around him would have to act like, wow, it's so funny, it's so funny. But now when he's at home, George is like, well, it's probably not that funny. And Martha says here, well, you make me pook. So, see how fast these transitions make. Suddenly, it's like he makes her feel like puking. And he says that wasn't a very nice thing to say, Martha. And Martha says, in the end, I like your anger. And you can see the play as kind of in a, uh, in a, in a weird manner, uh, Martha's um, attempts to spur George into action. He has kind of fallen into a sort of inactivity, in a fallen stupor. He's become so calm with himself. So Martha's things are like he wants, she wants to prick him into some sort of action. And she says, I like your anger. So we are not too sure often that if Martha is doing all this only to hurt George or to get some retaliation from George also, that retaliate, hit back at me. And uh, <laughs> she tells him, you're such a simp. And again, like uh, George calls Martha a cocker spaniel, which is again dehumanization, like I mentioned before. And they their references to they are my big teeth. And so again, uh, like I mentioned, the she-wolf and Martha is the she-wolf. And there says like, they're my big teeth. And George also says Martha's big teeth. And if you remember the big bad wolf in the Red Riding Hood myth, he tells her that um, Riding Hood tells, oh, grandma, how big teeth do you have? So this reference to big teeth kind of takes us back to that mythological world, that make-believe world. And how life, in a sense, has been thought in a certain way to follow these mythological patterns, that it follows, it goes around in these mythological patterns. Again, we have mentions like Martha saying, you cut that out, you're not so young yourself. So, so references to aging come up, and aging is a process of vulnerability. As I said, it's, it's a process of lateness. It's like things have gotten too late, it's aged, but they wouldn't like to accept that they have aged, but they have. And George says that I'm six years younger than you are. Uh, but Martha retaliates with you're going bald. And they, and they say, and they both have a laugh. So you see that this thing, it's, it has these moments of relaxation. Then again, it becomes serious. It, 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 it takes almost, it has a very inner flux. It has a very dynamic quality. You don't know what, what will happen next. And there are close references to improv that come in the play. We'll get there. We'll get there how the play makes references to improv, how it's, it almost feels like they're improvising on stage. Um, and as we know, improv is also another form of theater, which, um, and, um, okay, we'll come to that. Again, a reference to pig, dehumanization, and says, make me another drink, lover. My God, you can swill it down, can't you, Martha, imitating a tiny child, I'm thirsty. So as I mentioned, that there is this um, there is this weird need for the adults to be childlike, to feel childlike, almost in a form of security of that their adult life kind of takes away from them by exposing them to this reality around them. And so this play of reality and illusion that I said that that is so critical in this play that has been pointed out by many critics that this reality and illusion that we take part in illusions because we're fed up with the reality. But the illusions, the illusions that we take part in also tell something deep about 
the kind of reality we are running away from. It kind of, instead of effacing that reality, the illusions, what they do is strengthen the sense of reality, like, okay, this is the reality that you're trying to run away from. So it does not take uh, the fact that an illusion is coming in, it does not take away anything from the reality of the situations. And we'll see that Martha in her tidades, you'll note that what are the bad things she calls George. She calls him a blank, a cipher. And uh, he also tries to get back at her saying that, you know, there are more sick, there are really more sickening sights than you in, in a sense. So Martha says you're a zero. They're already starting to fight. They're already starting to like lock their horns before the guests have arrived. So we can see that there's already something of like a pressure cooker situation that is brewing in the house, which these unsuspecting guests will come into. It's almost like a spider's web that the spiders have woven their house and the unsuspecting flies who think that this is a place of hospitality, Nick and Honey would come in and get entangled, literally entangled, in, literally and metaphorically entangled in uh, these events. And you see, like, George murderously saying, I'm really looking forward to this, Martha. So the subversions, you know, I was pointing out that a person who's, like, really looking forward to having guests would also say, I'm really looking forward to this. But it's how we say it. So I, I mentioned that the stage directions come in, uh, are, are very, there are many stage directions in the play. There are constantly, like, how should this dialogue be delivered and everything. So this murderously, it's important here that it's being said murderously, that we know that, He's not literally meaning it, what he's trying to say. So I'll end this lecture today. And so in the next lecture, we'll start with the point where we see Honey and uh, Nick have come into their house.